All right, Psalms for Beginners, lesson number three. We're going to talk about wisdom psalms this week. Uh, I told you there were, like, uh, there were different categories of psalms. We're going to start with wisdom psalms, but before I do, as we do each week, a little bit of review, a minute or two of that. So we've studied that the, the Old Testament, true to the form of writing of the times, was written in mostly poetic form. Also that most of this poetry was divided into two main categories, nomic poetry or wisdom poetry, uh, things like Proverbs, Job, those, that's nomic poetry. And then there's lyric poetry, which is expressive, includes a variety of styles of poetry, more styles of poetry in lyric poetry than wisdom. Uh, Lamentations, for example, is lyrical poetry of mourning. Uh, mashals were uh, lyrical poems teaching lessons and parables. We talked about blessings and curses, you know, the type of uh, psalms that had both of these lyrical verses outlining the blessings and cursings upon those who obeyed or disobeyed God. Uh, and then there were also psalms which were a variety of lyrical verses that expressed different emotions and uh, thoughts. Um, we're also concentrating our study on this particular area of Jewish poetry, which is the, which is the Psalms. A lot of Psalms were written throughout the Old Testament uh, by a variety of writers. In other words, not all the Psalms are in the book of Psalms. There are Psalms throughout the Old Testament. They were originally collected together according to themes or special words or occasions. Eventually, many of these were collected into one major book with 150 selected psalms used by the Jews in their worship at the temple and at the synagogue. And we said that the several you know, groups were put together and sometimes uh, that accounts for similar psalms, like psalms that are exactly the same uh, because uh, two different collections were put together and that's where similar ones uh, appeared. And also uh, this 150 Psalms, this collection is what we refer to as the Book of Psalms. As far as the Book of Psalms is concerned, um, it contains Psalms from writers as early as Moses, about 14, 1500 BC, all the way to writings that were done after the return of the Jews from captivity in Babylon, somewhere around 400 BC. Uh, most were written by David, I said about 70 to 72, uh, written by David and his contemporaries, the sons of Korah and other authors are mentioned. Last week we studied the characteristics of the poetry of the Psalms, in other words there are devices that they use within the poetry, literary devices that make them unique as poetry. For example, we looked at the device called assonance, where similar sounding words that have different meanings were used to highlight or to contrast ideas. We talked about acrostics. An acrostic was a poem where each successive line used a successive um, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. So you'd have a poem, for example, that had 22 lines. Each line began with a successive letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And they used that very uh, imaginatively. You know, they made you know, poems that had three, for example, you know, with three sets of letters from the alphabet. And we'll get to Psalm 119, and it has a lot of different uh, devices like that, because they're the longest uh, of the Psalms. And then I spent a lot of time talking about parallelism, the device of parallelism, because it's the major device used in most of the Psalms. This is where ideas in one line of the psalm is either contrasted, repeated, augmented in another line in order to highlight. So the author will say one thing one way and then repeat the same idea but in a completely different way in the next line. Uh, so uh, this type of uh, device called parallelism, there were several types of parallelism, I'm not going to go through all of them uh, again, but uh, these were used, again, to contrast ideas and to heighten or to emphasize key ideas. One of the things I mentioned also about Hebrew poetry, very subtle. The devices are very, very subtle. They don't just jump out at you. You really have to, you know, you really have to 
look for them, to, to recognize them, and you will. You'll see tonight as we go through some, some of the Psalms that we're actually going to look at, I'll point out some of the devices and I think you'll be able to recognize them. All right, then we talked about uh, major categories, major categories of the Psalms. I mean, different scholars, you know, they chop them up in different ways, but these are the nine main, they're not only these types, there are others, but these are the main categories. So as you can read for yourself, there are wisdom psalms, nature psalms, I mean, they explain themselves, right? Word of God psalms, in other words, psalms that declare the beauty and the power and the sureness of the word of God. Uh, penitential psalms, psalms where the individual is repenting. Uh, worship psalms, again, explain themselves, usually about someone going to worship or uh, you know, uh, 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 excited about being in Jerusalem, for example, the worship psalms. Suffering psalms, again, uh, self-explanatory. Psalms of assurance, God is my rock, the Lord is my shepherd, you know, assurance psalms. Psalms of praise and royal psalms. Royal psalms usually were specifically written um, for a wedding, for a royal wedding or a coronation. They would write a special psalm to celebrate that particular uh, event. So today we're going to start with a review of wisdom psalms. So wisdom psalms. Uh, the first category of psalms, as I say, are the wisdom psalms. They are didactic in nature and practical. Didactic meaning they're designed to teach the reader. All right? uh, very practical in nature. Um, they teach something very basic and do it in a practical way. They're usually short summaries of experience and of common wisdom. In other words, you read it and you, it's not like, whoa, I never thought of that before. It's like, oh yeah, that's true. That's how life works. All right? Uh, they deal uh, with the sovereignty of God and the character of a righteous person and how this leads to questions dealing with deeper uh, moral and spiritual issues. Now the wisdom psalms can themselves be subdivided into three types. So three types of wisdom psalms. The first type are experience or experiential or uh, proverbial psalms. These are what are called mashals or a masculine. When you see a masculine or when you say a masculine of David or a mashal of David, meaning this is a wisdom, uh, this is an experience psalm uh, that teaches something uh, in particular. Short, pithy sayings of experience. So let's take a look at a wisdom psalm. Uh, psalm 49, verses one to four. Hear this, all peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth will speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart will be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will express my riddle on the harp. That's not the whole psalm, the beginning of one. But this psalm represents the characteristic style of the wisdom writer. We will do, we'll look at other wisdom psalms. They always start kind of in the same way. Hear this, O people. In other words, today we would say, listen up. <laughs> listen up. I want your attention. Everybody pay attention. Well, these wisdom psalms usually begin with a call to the people pay attention to what I'm going to be saying. So he says, hear this, all people, give ear, all inhabitants of the world. And do you notice the parallelism in that first line? The two sticks, remember? A line is usually divided into two or three sticks. So this first line here, hear this, all peoples, give ear, all inhabitants of the world. That's one line divided into two sticks. Notice the type of parallelism here, right? Synonymous parallelism. What does he say? Hear this, all peoples. And then in the second stick, give ear, all inhabitants of the world. Isn't he saying the same thing? Everybody, pay attention. And he says it a different way in the second line. Then in the third, third and fourth stick, rich and poor together, uh, excuse me, both, high and, uh, both low and high, <laughs> rich and poor together. Again, synonymous parallelism. 
You know, he's, he, taught, he says, hey, I'm talking to everybody, you, you who are low and you who are high. And then he says, those who are rich and those who are poor, same thing. Then he says, my mouth will speak wisdom. Next stick, and the meditation of my heart will be understanding. My mouth will speak wisdom, my heart from which my mouth speaks will be full of understanding. Again, synonymous parallelism. And then the final one, I will incline my ear to a proverb, I will express my riddle on the harp. Same thing, synonymous, same idea repeated in the same way. Let's look at another one. Psalm 78 verses one to four. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wondrous works that He has done. Same type, of, same type of beginning, a wisdom psalm. Listen, you people, he says, pay attention, I'm going to say something here. Right? The balance of the psalm shows how the people disregarded the wisdom that he was giving and were punished for it. In other words, the rest of Psalm 78, if I were to read all of it, we would see that even though he called out to the people to listen to his wisdom, in the end, they didn't pay attention and they were, you know, they were punished because of it. And again, we see um, uh, in this particular psalm, especially this part here, three and four, it's not synonymous parallelism, it's synthetic parallelism. What is synthetic parallelism? Remember, you start with something and then you add information as you go along. You, keep, you continue to synthesize it, you add stuff. So he says, uh, we will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works and all that he has done. He keeps adding stuff to the main idea, synthetic parallelism, uh, uh, synthetic and then climactic parallelism, building to a climax. When he says, and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done, boom, climactic. All right, another psalm. We're talking about experience, right? Experience psalms. Next one, Psalm 133, verses one to three. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. So here, of course, an observation on the joys of fraternal harmony. What kind of parallelism? Well, em emblematic parallelism. Why is it emblematic? Because he's using like and as. All right, let's go back. For brothers to dwell together, it is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down. So he's saying, uh, isn't it wonderful, uh, you know, brotherly love, harmony, isn't it? It's like this, it's like oil you know, dripping down because in those days you would anoint someone with oil and if you were wealthy you'd put a lot of oil and here he's saying so much oil that it just, it, 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 they didn't pour it, you know, it was just a dab. It was ceremonial, someone would come in, you'd anoint them with oil, a little bit of oil on the head, it would give off a bit of fragrance, it was expensive, you know, it was expensive, you couldn't do this, uh, but here he says, I mean, it's like the oil is, point, you know, it's overflowing. That's how wonderful it is. And so emblematic parallelism, comparison. One thing is compared to another. So there is experiential or experience uh, psalm in the wisdom category. All right, another type of wisdom psalm is called character psalm. The character psalm answers the question, how should a good person, good man, live before God? Now, the character psalm is similar to the experience psalm, but it's written in a different style, and usually it's much longer. The experience psalms are, are rather short. They're short, pithy statements, like uh, the previous psalm you know, only had like four or five, uh, four or five lines. The, um, the character psalm usually is developed in a much longer piece. 
Uh, these type of wisdom psalms answer the question, as I say, how should a good man live before God? So that's, let's go to uh, Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is called the threshold psalm because it begins the book of Psalms. Uh, it's been compared to the Sermon on the Mount, actually. Uh, psalm 1 is a wisdom psalm and it is a character type wisdom psalm where the author contrasts two ways of life in answering the question, how does a man become godly and what will be his fate? So let's take a look at the character psalm, psalm number one, verse one. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. So the premise is, how blessed Oh, the blessedness of, the wonder of, the happiness of, of who? Well, the importance of knowing what to avoid in building up the character of the godly man. So how does that person build up a godly character? According to the author, well, he avoids certain things. He avoids ideas and activities and the company of sinners, in other words, those who are rebelling before God, those who are disobedient to God. Note the synonymous parallelism where each stick in the first line repeats the same basic idea. And what is the basic idea? Well, it's to avoid sinners, to avoid sinners. Walk in the counsel of wicked. He, do, he does this, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. All right, verse two. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. So the importance of knowing what to do in order to build up the character of the godly man. So what does he say? Well, you avoid certain things and you do other things. His food, his nourishment is the law. In the Old Testament, when you said the law, you meant God's word. So his nourishment is God's word. He fills himself with God's word. This is how and why an ordinary man becomes a godly man. Notice he doesn't say he has to be rich. He has to have position. No, 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 no. He says the godly man does so by avoiding certain things and by doing other things. Again, note the synonymous parallelism where the same complete idea is repeated in different words Two sticks, same line. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. Okay. Same idea, repeated twice. Third verse. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and in whatever he does, he prospers. So here now he's He's, he's uh, describing the results of delighting and thinking on God's law. So the godly man avoids certain things and practices something else, which is feeding on God's word. And what happens to him if he feeds on God's word? Well, here he says he's like a tree planted by streams of water. In other words, he has access to a reservoir of nourishment for growth that is abundant and never ending. I like trees that are planted near a creek or a river. They're strong, the roots, the water's right there. He says uh, uh, this life and this style yields fruit in its season. In other words, he's productive because he's planted in a good place. He also says, and its leaf does not wither. He's continually renewed. In all he does, he says, he prospers. Well, that's self-explanatory. So the man who is nourished by the word is godly and produces spiritual fruit. Again, note the synthetic parallelism where each stick completes and amplifies the preceding line. So he says, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, makes that statement, and will yield its fruit in its season and the leaf will not wither and whatever he does will prosper. So he's, he makes a statement and then he adds stuff to it. That's synthetic parallelism. Like I said, very subtle, very subtle. Okay. Verses four and five. The wicked, he says, are not so, 
but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. So now he talks about the wretchedness and the, the wretchedness and the destiny of the wicked. The opposite conduct of godly man is now examined. In verse four he says, the wicked will not be able to stand the least adversity, they're rootless and they're faithless. In verse five, they will not be able to stand in the judgment and take their place with those who are godly. So not only will they not be able to withstand the pressure of life when it comes, because they're not being nourished by anything spiritual, when the judgment comes, they will not be with the godly. They will not be judged with that particular group. So again, remember we said wisdom psalm, pretty simple stuff. We're not talking about deep, deep theological ideas here. I mean, I think, I think any one of us here could have written something similar, perhaps not poetically this beautiful, but if, they had, if we had to write a composition, uh, tell us what, in, in 20 lines, tell us what happens to the good and the bad. Well, you know, we, we could all say, well, you know, people who are good and obey God you know, can look forward to a life that is better and a judgment that will, you know, they won't be condemned. And the bad people, well, they'll be condemned and they won't have a reward. We can all say that. Well, that's pretty much what he says here. Okay. Now, verse six, the final sum, uh, summation. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So God knows his own. He will punish the wicked. He will bless the godly. Again, this time the antithetic parallelism in this verse where the second sticks idea is contrasted to the idea put forth in the first stick. So the first stick, the Lord knows the way of the righteous and by, you know, by, by extension and will judge them favorably. The opposite, but the way of the wicked will perish. Antithetic, opposite. Uh, let's look at another psalm, another character psalm. Now another wisdom psalm in the character type, this time the question is, who is the worthy worshiper? All right, the first question was, you know, what type of character do you need to be pleasing to God? And what will happen to you? Well, this one here is, who's the worthy worshiper? First verse, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? So the question is posed, who is the acceptable one to you in worship? And who is worthy to come before you? The tent and the holy hill, of course, is the temple in Jerusalem, or symbolically the presence of God. Who, not just who can go to Jerusalem and worship at the temple, who can go before Almighty God? You know, who's worthy to do that? Verse one is, is an example, again, of synonymous parallelism, where the idea in the second stick is the same as the first, but expressed in different words. So, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Pretty much the same idea. Verses two to five answers this question in both positive and negative forms, all right? So, positive first in verse two. He who walks with integrity, and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. So the one who is able to go before God to the temple is the one who walks with integrity. Integrity is a rule of life, a man of principle. That's the one who can come before God. A man or man, woman who works righteousness. In other words, acts according to God's will. And then he says, speaks the truth in his heart. Just a way of saying who is not a hypocrite. What he thinks and what he believes is the same as what he says and does. So who can come before God, whether at the temple or just before God in prayer? A, man of, a person of integrity who lives righteously, who is not a hypocrite, who thinks and, 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 and says the things that he actually does. So that's the positive. He's the one who can go. Now he's going to look at the negative side of it. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. So he does these things and he avoids these things. All right? He doesn't slander, in other words, prudent speech, self-control, he's not a gossip. Does no evil to a neighbor, 
does not seek to bring others down, nor takes up a, a reproach against his friend. In other words, this person is careful not to distress his friends with careless talk about things that they may have done and since regretted. You know the famous, uh, the best man speech at the wedding? <laughs> and the best man has had too much to drink? <laughs> and says, well, you know, instead of saying something nice, he gets off and he, you know, he loses his composure and he says something embarrassing about what he and the groom once did on a you know, weekend trip to Florida or something. You know, the, yeah, he, he doesn't distress his friends by saying things that may be embarrassing uh, or cause him distress. That's negative. Whoop, he's, now he slips back into positive mode again, verse four, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. So what is he saying here? Well, he hates unrighteousness. He gives no honor to evil men. He gives favor to those who honor God. And he stands by his word, even when doing so causes inconvenience or financial loss. That's, that's a pretty good, you want a friend like that. You want to be able to depend on a person like that, that uh, who, who may have given his word and made a promise and then later on finds out that, oh, this is going to cost me way more than I thought, but sticks with their word anyways. He said, this is the kind of person that, that can come before God in prayer and worship. All right, switches back to negative again in verse 5a. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. So he doesn't practice usury. Taking advantage of the poor in distress, it was against the law uh, among the Israelites to lend to a fellow Israelites at interest. You could lend him, but you couldn't charge him interest. You could, you could lend to a foreigner, you could lend to a non-Jew, a Gentile, yes, at interest, but you couldn't do it uh, to a fellow uh, Israelite. And he also says, this person will not thwart the process of justice or be induced to accept a bribe uh, to uh, injure the innocent. We, we finish off here, not with another positive, but with a summary statement at the very end. He says, he who does these things will never be shaken. The person with such qualities, positive, you know, doing these things, avoiding these other things, will never be moved, will be worthy of being and remaining in the presence of God. The idea isn't just I go to the presence of God to offer my prayers. The idea is, I, my objective is, I am always in the presence of God. Sometimes I'm not praying, sometimes I'm working, sometimes I'm sleeping, sometimes I'm eating, but I'm always in His presence. This is the kind of person who can remain in the presence of God at all times. Note again, the contrasting and balancing of positive and negative ideas on the same theme in, in this character type of wisdom psalm. Okay, so wisdom psalms, right? Um, uh, experience type, character type, the third type. The third type is ethical, ethical psalms. They deal with the deeper problems of ethics and religion. So let's uh, do one of these ethical psalms. In Psalm 49, this psalm asks the question, if God is sovereign over all, why does He allow the wicked to prosper and escape penalties while godly souls are denied success and happiness? It's just not fair. The bad guy, the crook, you know, lives to be 90 years old, dies in his sleep with his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren around him. Never sick a day in his life. The other person, a righteous person, knows nothing but trouble and sorrow and dies a painful death at a young age. Why? It's not fair. That's, that's the question that's being asked here in Psalm 49. Uh, and you'll, if, I don't have it on my slide here, but in the book, you'll note that there are instructions for the choir for singing, and the author is one of the sons of Korah for this particular uh, uh, psalm. So he says this, hear this all people, give ear all inhabitants of the world. So right away when you read those two first lines, you know, you click, oh, this is an experience psalm. This is a wisdom psalm. Why? Because he's calling everyone to attention, to pay attention to what he's going to say. 
both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth will speak wisdom and the meditation of my heart will be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will express my riddle on, a harp, uh, on the harp. I've read this before to give you an example of a, of, of a wisdom psalm, but now we're actually examining the content of this uh, psalm. So in verses one to four, this is the typical opening for a wisdom psalm. Verses five and six, he says, why should I fear in days of adversity when the iniquity of my foes surrounds me? Even those who trust in their wealth and boast in the abundance of their riches. So here's the problem. Should a poor man be afraid when the rich man is against him? What about justice for the poor and the oppressed? This is the question he's asking here. Verses seven to 12, he'll give the answer, the first part of his answer. So verse seven to nine. No man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of his soul is costly and he should cease trying forever, that he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo decay. So the first thing he kind of puts out there is wealth cannot buy off God when death comes. That's what he's saying. Well, what will you give? Will you give God a ransom for somebody's soul? The redemption of his soul is costly and he should cease trying. You shouldn't even bother trying to buy back the soul from death. There's no amount of money that can buy you that kind of power. So he expresses that idea to begin with. Verses 10 and 11, for he sees that even wise men die, the stupid and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses are forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They have called their lands after their own name. So he, you know, he declares the obvious, everybody dies. And the grave is the answer to those who sought to perpetuate themselves by giving their names to great estates. In other words, the people who build monuments and put their names on them and buildings and their name, you know, <laughs> certain uh, politicians have their name on their planes. You know, the, he said, it doesn't matter how, how many monuments you make to yourself, when you die, <laughs> these things will not prolong your life. Verse 12, but man in his pomp will not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. So he says, you know, death is the great equalizer. Men and beasts all die in the same way. So this is a partial answer, uh, but it is, it is not necessarily very comforting. In other words, when there's injustice in the world, you know, how come there's no justice? And then he says, well, to begin with, you can't buy back your life with money. As far as the rich are concerned, it doesn't matter if they're rich and it doesn't matter if they're oppressing you. One day they're going to die just like you and like the animals. So that's his first answer. Well, you know, that's not too com it's true, but it's not too comforting. Now, part two of his answer, verse 13 and 14. He says, this is the way of those who are foolish and of those after them who approve their words, Silla. Silla, when you see Silla, some believe that that means to pause. Pause and consider what has been said. You know, think about uh, what has just been said to you. Uh, others think it's a musical notation. So there's a little debate among scholars exactly what that instruction is, but those are two of the possibles. Anyways, he goes on to say, as sheep, they are appointed for shale, Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning, and their form shall be for Sheol to consume, so that they have no habitation. So the real answer lies in what happens after the grave, he says. The foolish, you know, the rich oppressors, they will be led by death, the shepherd, there's an image there, into Sheol, which is the place of suffering for the dead. Their wealth will no longer have power to serve them in this place. In other words, their money will not buy them out. Verse 15, but God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me, again, Selah. So he says, but the poor, the righteous man, God will save by himself, meaning God himself will provide a ransom to bring these people out. In other words, God will pay their way out of Sheol so that they can be with Him. Now here's a, again, this right here, this right here is a messianic promise. 
Think about that. In the days of David, you know, 700 years before Christ, they, they, they were not making some very clear, you know, Jesus will come and die on the cross and be raised the third. <laughs> I mean, the closest you came to that type of imagery was in Isaiah 53, but here in the Psalms, this idea is, is clearly expressed. God is going to Himself redeem my soul out of Sheol, out of death, and bring me out of death so that I can be with Him. That, that's, a, that's a revolutionary idea. Today we go, yeah, big deal, we know that. We hear the gospel every Sunday, but this was tremendous at this time. So here you have a, a messianic promise embedded in this particular uh, uh, wisdom psalm. Uh, verse 16 and, uh, to 20, he gives some lessons. He's expressed the problem, the rich oppressing the poor. He's uh, expressed some of the solutions. The, the, the rich are going to die anyway, so don't worry about it. Uh, and, and, and then he says the real solution is, but God will save the poor. He'll take them out of the place of the, the dying or the dead so that they can be with him and live. All right, some lessons that we learn from this. Verses 16 and 17, he says, do not be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased, for when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him. Though while he lives, he congratulates himself, and though men praise you when you do well for yourself, he shall go to the generation of his fathers. They will never see the light. Lesson number one, the knowledge of the doom of Sheol removes the luster of the rich man's wealth here. The darkness there, he says, is much greater than the, the glory of wealth that exists here. Lesson number two in verse 20. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. A man who lives without considering the eternal issues of the salvation of his own soul, that, that's under, a man who lives without understanding, even though he is rich and famous or powerful, is no better than an animal because in the end they both perish. In other words, they die without hope after the grave. That's lesson number two. So there, these are some of the wisdom psalms, first category, wisdom psalm, psalms of experience, psalm of character, and uh, ethical psalms. All right, next time we get together, we're going to talk about nature psalms, nature psalms, and that's it. All righty, thank you for your wonderful, riveted attention. <laughs>